Hi, I'm Randy Johnson. In this three-part series, I cover the essential steps of getting started with CNC. So if you're new to CNC or considering your first machine, this series will give you a jump start on understanding the basics of using the software and operating the machine. Part one covers CNC workflow and the basics of using vCarve to design a simple project. Part two covers setting up the toolpaths and machining the project we design. In part three, We'll look at using a 3D model to create a simple 3D relief carving. Along the way, you're likely to hear some new terms. This is part of the CNC learning curve. But the good news is that CNC is fast becoming part of mainstream woodworking, and there are lots of resources available for you to further expand your CNC skills. The first thing I want to cover is what's referred to as CNC workflow. CNC workflow is the process of going from idea to finished project via the CNC. It breaks down into two primary phases, the design phase and the machine phase. The design phase starts with your idea, which you then convert to a drawing on your computer. You then assign router bits to the various lines of your drawing to create what is called the toolpaths. These toolpaths are then used to control the CNC movements. In the machine phase, you transfer the toolpaths from the design software to the CNC machine. For some machines, this is done on a thumb drive and a handheld pendant, as shown in the picture. For other machines, you attach your computer directly to the machine, but both methods have their advantages. The pendant is convenient and includes all the essential controls readily available at your fingertips. Plus, it keeps your computer out of your dusty shop. The advantage of using a computer is that it provides more visual feedback because it has a larger screen and more on-the-fly editing capabilities. However, I've used them both and I really don't have a preference. In this first session, I'm going to focus on how to create a drawing for the project. For that, we need a piece of design software. This is often referred to as CAD CAM. And as you can see here, CAD refers to computer-aided design and CAM refers to computer-aided manufacturing. But if you just simply think of the fact that this piece of software is used to create your drawings and then create the program that drives your machines, that's the essence of it. There's a large number of CAD CAM programs available on the market and just a few of them are listed here. They range in price from almost free to very expensive. The one that I'm going to be using for this presentation will be VCarve. It's very common, it comes with lots of machines, and it's a good middle-of-the-road program, both in price and yet it's very capable. When you first open VCarve, you're presented with the opportunity to create a new file. And simply by clicking on create a new file, opens up the main window. And on the left side of the main window is a selection of options that you need to set up when you're first setting up your project. The first one is to decide your job type. In this case, we're gonna be carving on just one side of the material, so we'll set it up as a single-sided project. Next in line is your job size. And this typically refers to the size of your board. However, it can also refer to the entire table. But in this case, we'll use it for our lumber, and we'll set it up at 16 by seven and a half by three quarters of an inch thick. Next in line is what's called Z0 position. And that refers to where you're going to measure the bit movement vertically from. So in this case, we're setting it up for material surface. So all the bits, all the movement of the bit will be measured from that zero location up or down. Next in the list is what's referred to as XY datum position. And this refers to where the X and Y location for the machine is set up. In this case, it'll be the center of the material and all the movements will be measured from that, that location for the XY machine movements. You can also use any of the four corners as well. You'll notice that these first three, these three that we just set up, they all refer to X, Y, and Z. And those are the directions of movements on the typical CNC machine. This machine, as uh, most woodworking CNC machines are referred to as a three-axis CNC machine because they move in three directions, and thus they have three axes. The Z-axis is always the spindle or the router which moves up and down. 
the Y and the X axis move left and right and forward and back. On some machines, the X and the Y are reversed from what you see here, but the setup is essentially the same. Next in line is what's called design scaling. We'll leave this unchecked right now because this primarily applies to if you already have a drawing. If I have a drawing in this, pick, in this work area and I want to go to a different size material, having this checkbox will automatically increase or decrease the size of my design based on any changes I make in the top up here on the size of the material. But since we're just creating a brand new drawing, we don't need to use that, app, that uh, checkbox for this project. The next two options primarily apply to 3D modeling setup, so we don't need to use those or worry about those for this setup either. Now that we have everything set up in the software, we can simply click on OK to go to the main window again. In the main window, you have three main areas that you'll be working in. The left area are the design tools, and on the right side you have the toolpath tools, and in the middle you have the project design area. Also along the top you have two tabs. One is referred to as the 2D tab, and that's the view we're currently in, and the 2D tab is, is where you do all of your drawing work and your design work. If you click on the 3D tab, that opens up a 3D view, or which is essentially a preview window of the tool paths that you'll create later on after you've created the design. And you can click back and forth at those at any time. So going back to the 2D view, we're now ready to set up and start our project. But before we do that, it's always a good idea to save your file, especially the first time you're starting it. Just like any program in your computer, if you fail to save it and your computer crashes, you'll lose all your work. So clicking on the Save icon will bring up folders on your computer to where you then can name your file and then click on Save. Once you've saved it, you'll notice that the name of the file appears at the top of your screen. For this project, I've already created a simple sketch. However, if you also have some artwork that you can start with, it also helps streamline the process. The quickest way to import some artwork is to use the little tab at the top here called Import Bitmaps, and that'll give you access to files on your computer where you can locate the image that you wish to use. For this project, I'm going to use this grouper silhouette, click on Open, and it brings it straight into the drawing area. Now it's a little small, so I want to increase the size, so I'm going to use the Set Size tool over here at the left, which opens up the Set Size sub-window. What we initially see here are the existing dimensions for our piece of clip art, followed by the pink line around the outside. I want to make sure and check this box that is called Link XY. That way when I start changing the size on this drawing, it will do it equally in both directions. So I'm going to enter 12 for the width, and the height proportionally increases because I have that Link XY checked. And that size looks good, so I'm good on that. I'm going to click Apply to exit that window. Now back in the main window, I need to create a line that goes around this silhouette. I can't carve this silhouette directly, so I'm going to use a tool called Trace Bitmap. It's an automatic way to create a line around a simple piece of clip art like this. This opens up again, another sub-window, and Experience has showed me that when I'm first starting out, I'm just going to accept all the defaults up here because it's a fairly simple piece of clip art and click on Preview. When I click on Preview, I automatically get the line that I want all the way around my object. Since this looks good, I can click Apply to save that line and then Close to exit the window. Now I'm looking at my main work area again. And I see I've got the bitmap, which is the gray area, and the line. I don't need the bitmap any longer, so I'm going to hide it by going up to the Layers tab up here, clicking on that, which drops down the list of layers. You can think of layers as transparent pieces of paper, and on each piece of paper, you could have different bits of information. In this case, we have a layer called bitmap layer, and that's where our click art, clip art exists right now, and then layer 1 is where the drawing lines exist. 
And there's ways to move information back and forth between layers. But right now what I want to do is I want to turn off the little light bulb by the bitmap layer. And when I do that, it hides the bitmap. That bitmap is still in my program. It's still saved, so I can go back and turn it back on if I want. But right now, I just want to be working with my line that went around the fish. So I can close out of that layers window, going back to the main. So before we step a little further, we just you just saw how I very simply traced that existing piece of clip art. You're going to get different results from different pieces of clip art. And that's shown here in this illustration. So a silhouette is by far the simplest and quickest and easiest way to trace a piece of clip art. However, if you have other types of colored images, you can also trace those. But you'll notice as the clip art becomes more complex, the tracing becomes more complex as well. Now these two here have a few extra lines here and there, which you probably would be able to go back into the drawing and delete it. This one has a lot more internal lines, but it looks like the border around the outside is pretty solid. However, the photograph presents the greatest problem, and photographs simply do not work well using the automatic bitmap tracing tool. However, there are ways to take a photograph and trace it manually to create a very nice piece of uh, a very good drawing. And I'm going to demonstrate that later on. But for right now, let's go back to our main drawing and work on our project. And for next, according to my plan, I want to add some text to the middle of this. So I'm going to use the text tool. And simply by entering the text that you want in the text field, you then can select a font. You can choose the alignment and the text height as well. You don't have to worry about getting it perfectly aligned because it's very easy to do that on the fly. In fact, I can simply grab that text and move it up towards the middle to make it fit where I want. When I have it located and sized like I like it, I can simply close out of this box here and it takes me back to my main screen again. I now have my text and my main out vector. But this is the finished project concept that I really want. I want to have a little v-carving all the way around the outside as well as an edge that's cut out. And for that I need a couple extra lines. So I'm going to start by selecting my click clicking on this outside line and then I'm going to use a tool called the offset vectors tool. Now you're hearing the word vector. Vector is what lines are referred to in vCarve and many other types of programs. They're a special kind of line that scales large and small without losing any quality and they are required in order to create the type of tool paths that we're going to create for this project. So when I open up the vectors tool, again, I get another sub window and I get some options here. I want this line to go outward to the outside of this. I want the distance to be a quarter of an inch. And after it's created, I want to select the new line because I need to still create yet another line. So all I need to do is click offset. The new line is automatically created and it's automatically selected. I'm going to use all the same settings again and click, uh, click Offset again. And now I have a total of three lines, which is what I need for this project. I'm done with the Offset tool, so I can close out of that window, which then takes me back again to my main window. Now, before I leave this main window, I want to save the file again. Again, save frequently so you don't lose your work. Next up, we need to create the tool paths for this design, and those are listed on the right of the vCarve window. However, before we jump into that, I want to back up a little bit. I mentioned how using a photograph is a problem for using the bitmap tracing tool, and it is. It simply doesn't work well. However, using some of the manual drawing tools in vCarve, you can, in fact, take a nice photograph and get a very nice drawing of that and with as much detail as you like. So at this point I'm going to hop over to the vCarve software and do a live demo of using this photograph to do a manual tracing to create a drawing similar to this. So we'll start out by creating a new file, same as we did before, and then go in and check the size 
and these sizes will work fine for this project. I'm going to set up the Z0 position at the top of the material, the same as we did before, as well as the XY datum to the middle of the material. Click OK. And same as before, we want to go in and import the photograph, in this case, go into Bitmap Import, locate the photograph, click on Open, it brings it in. The size of it is pretty good, but I want to increase it a little bit. Showed you earlier how to use the set size to increase it, but you can also grab one of the open handles in any of the four corners to stretch it out. And that'll work as well. Now the first thing we want to look at when working with this type of bitmap, a photograph, we want to trace it. And right now, this photograph is selected, it's active as an object, and you can tell that if zooming in, we can see there's a pink line around the outside and we see the image in full color. If I click to the side, it turns semi-transparent. And this is the view in which we need to do our tracing. And as you can see, if we look at the mouth, it has almost disappeared. So to solve that, I'm going to reselect the photo so it's in full color, right click, go down to Object Properties, which gives us the option to set the amount of fading. And then I'm going to adjust the fading down just enough so I can see some of the mouth outline to be able to trace around it. So next I'm going to get the Draw Line tool. There are several ways in which you can manually trace this object. I tend to just stick with the draw line tool and then go back and adjust the lines later. And I'll show you how that's done. So I'm going to, using the wheel on my mouse, I'm going to zoom in on the upper fin. And I'm going to start at the front of it. Clicking once gives me the line. It anchors the line and gives me a bit of a rubber band line. I can go to the top of that spine, click again and just keep clicking at the high and low spots. I'm not too concerned at this point about the accuracy because I'm going to go back later and fine tune the shape of all these angles and parts. But then when I get back to this fan, I can just add a couple of general lines. So I'm going to go and hit some of the high points and some of the low points. It's actually better to start with if you have fewer lines or fewer points than more. That'll become evident here in a little bit when we start adjusting the lines. And again, zooming in and out with the wheel mouse makes it easy to get in close or to zoom out. So I'm going to zoom in close on the mouth. Oh, that anchored itself. That's okay. I can correct that later. I'm just going to keep on clicking and adding points along this shape. Go up to the top up here. I'm going to go up and turn on my snap. That way it'll anchor it to the starting point and join that line back together. I now have the rough tracing complete. And close out of that window. The next step is what's called node editing. It's uh, maybe an intermediate level skill, but it's definitely one you want to learn because it greatly expands the capabilities of designing custom designs. To activate that, I select the line so it turns into a pink dotted line. Again, I'll zoom in and then right click Going down the list, it says Node Edit Mode. When I click on that, all the nodes on this line are highlighted. We also see some light gray nodes here in the middle. These are midpoint nodes that if you grab them, they will turn into regular nodes and you can start to modify the shape. So what are the 
ways in modifying these lines and making them curved is once I pull that line in, I can right click on it and it gives me the option to smooth that point. And then I can grab what the nodes and move those nodes around to fit the shape that I want. So I'm going to continue doing this with all these nodes, pulling an extra node in, smoothing it a bit. And I'll continue working my way around the fish for all the parts. Do the fin here. It probably has the most points on it to start with. Can round that one. And I can pull that down a little bit. I could go in here, and if I want to mimic that, I could grab the midpoint and pull it out, and then actually smooth it and move the handles as they're referred to. At this point, I may not need, so I go in and actually delete it and control it with that handle to get the shape that I want. Again, I'll make this node smooth, and I'll make this one up here smooth, move the line around, and it's surprising with just a few nodes how much of the shape you're actually able to mimic. One of the things I do when I work on these is I try and sort of challenge myself how few of points can I get by with. And usually it's a point on the high spot, the low spot, and maybe one in between. But you'll find that if you use too many points, you'll actually end up with a line that is a little irregular and actually harder to control. At this point, I'm going to stop with this. You can always go back and tweak it later. I'm going to right click twice to get out of the node edit mode. And then I'm going to go up to the layers like we did before and turn off the bitmap layer. That now reveals the vectors that I've created for this fish. Again, it's a very clean set of vectors. You could go back in here and adjust these. If you wanted to adjust them a little more, go back into node edit. You want to pull that vector up, make the tail a little larger, and then you can start to customize the fish the way you'd like it. Make the fin larger or smaller. And now you have your main vectors for the fish the same as we did with the main silhouette. So next up, we need to create the tool paths for our gone fishing project. And we'll do that in video two. See you there.